Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, and to the Las Casas Institute for the invitation and for setting up this day. I'm, I'm sure it prom promises to be a marvellous and, and stimulating day. Uh, my task is to talk about faith in relation to money. Truth-telling about money matters is at first sight rather simple. One has a duty to tell the truth about income so as to pay a just share of taxes. One has a duty to describe what one sells accurately so that buyers can choose whether they wish to pay that price. One has a duty to disclose vested interests so that others can judge one's partiality. One has a duty to promise only what one intends to perform and to perform what one has promised. Truth-telling is a condition of trust, and trust, as all agree, is the condition for any cooperative economic life. Now, truth-telling can be ensured by transparency, by the capacity of others to check what one says. A transparent truth is like a common coin whose value remains unchanged as it passes from hand to hand. To tell the truth is to be transparent. But what complicates this picture of truth as transparency is uncertainty about the future. How can I tell the truth about what I will do? How many economic transactions are not simple exchanges but involve promises regarding the future? It's one thing to be transparent about decisions and promises. It's quite another to be transparent about deliberations, for deliberations do not always inspire trust. Let me offer an illustration. Sir Mervyn King relates a story about when he first started at the Bank of England, and he asked the legendary former chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Vol Volcker, for his advice. Mystique was the response. <laughs> In more recent times, the mystique of central bankers has been replaced by transparency. But once the Monetary Policy Committee minutes are published, in the interests of transparency, King relates that the real negotiations had to take place beforehand. Truth-telling, then, involves more than transparency. It involves being worthy of trust. So moral conduct remains central to truth-telling. Truth-telling depends on integrity. Now, an early 20th century French philosopher, Émile Chartier, taught his pupils that an idea is not true by itself, independent of the thinker. It is not right to speak of a true idea, but rather of true thoughts of true men and women. On this conception, truth-telling has a greater bearing on the person than on the facts. So with perfect consistency, Chartier was more renowned for his teaching than his writing, like his own teacher before him, uh, Jules Lagneau. The aim for them, for philo of philosophy, is to be true rather than to discover or state a truth. Chartier in turn taught a method of learning how to think, how to be sincere with oneself, by means of an extreme act of attention brought to bear on the art of writing. And his most famous pupil, Simone Weil, once wrote in her notebooks, and I quote from memory, the same phrase, for example, a man says to a woman, I love you, can have an entirely different meaning depending on the depths of soul from which it is spoken. This is a thought that sometimes keeps me awake at night. What might it mean to be someone who speaks from the depths of soul? Not that, I'm, uh, that such insomniac vigilance in any way constitutes depth. A precondition for attaining such depths is to abandon concern with one's own soul for the sake of concern with life, with the matters at hand. But the question that concerns me today is this. Is there a truth to tell about money? which is not merely transparent, a truth which only has meaning when it is understood from a certain depth. Is there a truth about money that cannot be audited in accounts? Is there a link between truth-telling about money as a condition of trust and a way of living and handling money as an expression of faith? 
So what I have to say about faith and money today might have more to do with mystique than it does with transparency. To tell the truth is to speak words of substance. Such words can be trusted because the substance they offer acts as their guarantee. In the contemporary world, we are less inclined to trust in the substance of personal authority, the mystique of depths of soul, although such an aura has at times been generated around certain central bankers. Instead, we wish to feel the weight of the words before we can trust them. But what is substance? A person of substance can be an expression for a person of wealth. Might this offer an appropriate analogy? Well, perhaps not. When it comes to telling the truth, is a person of substance a person with a wealth of facts at their command, like an internet search engine? Clearly not. A person of substance can discern which facts are pertinent, which are relevant, which relations have a decisive bearing on the situation at hand. We need to look elsewhere. Philosophy, since Aristotle, has distinguished between substance and accidents, between what is truly real and what can be said about it, between the things themselves and what happens to them. On this understanding, to tell the truth about money is not simply to explain the facts about how much money and on what occasion, but to understand the substance involved in money. What is money? The answer to that, such a question is notoriously difficult. It's often easier to say what money does rather than what money is. It's commonly been thought that money is a token, a symbol of value, and therefore that it should symbolise some real substance, such as gold, which would embody the truth about money. Yet the substance of value in gold is no easier to explain. Historical periods when money was attached to the gold standard have been limited. Perhaps money has been many different things at different times. To tell the truth about money would then involve saying, exactly what kind of money is involved. A bar of gold, a copper coin, a banknote, a local currency for a babysitting circle, a site deposit, a payment card, a mobile phone app, a potential overdraft, a bitcoin. Each of these might have a rather different nature. Similarly, a US dollar, a Chinese renminbi and a Zimbabwean dollar might have different natures depending on, on the kind of institutional backing that they receive and the respective faith that they inspire. The substance, as well as the value of money, may depend on how these things are perceived. So in order to approach the question, what is money? I think we would do well to listen to people of substance who are qualified to tell the truth about money today. Sir Mervyn King, Governor of the Bank of England from 2003 to 13, explains the creation of money as a byproduct of the process of credit creation by private banks. He calls this a process of alchemy, the conversion of faith into an equivalent of gold. He writes, by alchemy, I mean the belief that all paper money can be turned into an intrinsically valuable commodity such as gold on demand, and that money kept in banks can be taken out whenever depositors ask for it. The truth is that money in all forms depends on trust in its issuer. Confidence in paper money rests on the ability and willingness of governments not to abuse their power to print money. Bank deposits are backed by long-term risky loans that cannot quickly be converted into money. For centuries, alchemy has been the basis of our system of money and banking. So banks, private banks, commercial banks, are the main source of money creation in the UK economy. They create deposits as a byproduct of making loans to risky borrowers. The, those deposits are used as money. Banks are able to perform 
to transform short-term liabilities into long-term assets. In essence, they borrow short and lend long. Notice the phrase, in essence. The substance of money is depicted here as maturity transformation, using site deposits which can be requested on demand and lending them out for long-term loans, such as mortgages. But I cannot help thinking that this phrase, in essence, is potentially just a little misleading here, for it seems to imply that banks have to receive the money in the short term before they can make their long-term loans. On this point, uh, Lord Turner, chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority from 2008 until recently, is slightly more precise. He writes, banks do not intermediate already existing money, but create credit, money, and purchasing power that did not previously exist. They make loans to borrowers, crediting an asset on the bank's balance sheet. At the same time, they put money in the borrower's account, creating a bank liability. The loan is repayable at a later date, but the money is immediately available. It is this maturity transformation that creates <coughs> effective purchasing power. So in the UK economy, 98% of money is created in this way. Money is essentially credit, and credit is essentially faith. What does this mean in practice? As I understand it, money is always a particular concrete reality relating to particular debts and obligations. For example, I've just taken out a mortgage from Nationwide of £185,000. My solicitor seemed surprised that Nationwide could instantly produce the funds on the same day as their final decision about my mortgage. I was not, because this is newly created money. So, Nationwide now has the asset of a long-term loan to myself. It also had the immediate liability that the money had to be transferred straight away to the client account of my solicitor with Lloyd's before moving rapidly on to the client account of my, uh, my seller's solicitor, part of it then going on to his lender, part for him to spend. So how could Nationwide afford to pay out money in this way? Well, on the same day, other Nationwide borrowers will have sold their houses and paid off their mortgages, and moreover, reserves transferred between the main banks, who are all issuing mortgages and fresh loans each day, the reserves transferred largely cancel out. And interest can be paid on any excess at the overnight interbank lending rate. Yet the money that I have borrowed now continues to be transferred from one person's bank account to another as each new owner spends it in turn. So what are they spending? In one respect, this money, once accepted by another bank, no longer has any relation to me. Its value is guaranteed by the solvency of each bank where it is deposited in turn. But in another respect, the very fact of the existence of this money is based on my promise to repay my mortgage, in turn backed by my employment contract with the University of Nottingham. It's also based on Nationwide's trust in both those promises, together with their trust in their surveyor's valuation of my property, as well as trust that even if I do default, it's unlikely that the property market will crash at the same time. And if this last belief seems a little bit rash, given recent experience, there remains the trust that Nationwide can go to the lender of last resort, the Bank of England, or perhaps an implicit trust that it could be bailed out by the government as a financial institution that is too big to fail. So the creation of money then involves concrete relations of trust between particular individuals and institutions. The spending and transfer of money involves trust placed by individuals and businesses, in particular banking institutions, as well as in the solvency of the financial system 
itself. To tell the truth about the substance of money then is to speak of this faith and of how well founded it is. How solvent is the global financial system? If we imagine that the global financial system is a distribution of assets, each owned by separate institutions, where exchanges take place based on preferences and expectations about the future, then we're not quite telling the truth about money. For financial assets are not simply owned. One person's asset is always another's liability. An asset's value depends on the solvency of that debtor. That solvency in turn is dependent on other debtors. Just as the money derived from my mortgage is a consolidation of some very specific promises and relations of trust, so the financial system is a network of interlocking liabilities and obligations that stand and fall together. If it is to remain standing, it has to be guaranteed by faith in the system as a whole. Now, there's a highly influential narrative which inspires faith in this global financial system, and it's ultimately a faith in money. On this account, the role of money, banking and finance is to complete markets, to aid the global economy in approximating to a market. For if people were to meet with a different order and range of preferences, expectations and goods, as if in a barter economy or, or auction, they will, be, they will find it hard to meet others with complementary preferences, expectations and goods without money as a medium of exchange, a standard of account and a store of value. Similarly, banking facilitates secure exchange and finance channel savings into investments, shares risk through insurance, and offers continuous valuation of assets. Now, the comforting feature about this narrative, modelled on a village market where people bring their wares to sell, is that a balance between supply and demand can be found. If one product is in excess, the price can drop until buyers are found or suppliers reduce their production. Even if the real world only vaguely approximates to a market in this way, so long as there is a tendency towards equilibrium, to the balancing of supply and demand, then the system will tend towards stability. Money, then, is the ground for faith if it effectively facilitates market relations. Now, I want to be a little bit controversial and suggest that while this narrative accounts for one dynamic in economic life, to suppose that such a tendency towards equilibrium is determining in the last instance, is entirely fanciful. For one thing, financial markets have only one product on offer, essentially. A product prefer preferred above all others and in unlimited amounts. We could always want more of it. A rate of profit as measured against risk. So they only mediate differences of expectations, not really of preferences. And expectations, like markets themselves, are volatile. For another, credit leads to investment, invention, and continually new products and possibilities. There's never any stability or equilibrium. And for a third, financial markets are not composed of independent economic agents exchanging assets, but of mutually dependent economic agents bound by obligations, contracts and liabilities, so that a failure of one institution can lead to a failure of all. To treat a loan as an asset, then, is not really to tell the truth about money. It will only have become an asset in hindsight once it has been paid off and the loan discharged. Now, I'm not alone in saying this. Mervyn King, in his new book, 
um, in his account, a monetary economy behaves very differently from the textbook description of a market economy because it introduces radical uncertainty. There are no ras rational expectations about the future under conditions of real uncertainty. As he puts it, radical uncertainty drives a gaping hole through the idea of complete and competitive markets. The future markets, which would be needed to produce an equilibrium, simply cannot and do not exist yet. So the market economy cannot, therefore, coordinate spending plans. There are too many missing markets. It seems to me that in financial markets, it's not a balance of supply and demand that produces a tendency towards equilibrium, but an unwarranted faith in markets themselves, in the existence of market fundamentals and an underlying price. It's this that produces consistent behaviour and this that offers temporary appearances of equilibrium. So it's the faith in markets, faith in fundamentals, not the actual fundamentals. There's no such thing. To tell the truth about money is to speak not merely of negative feedback and tendencies towards equilibrium and stability, but also of positive feedback and tendencies towards radical disequilibrium and uncertainty. I'd like to illustrate this disequilibrium with a few figures borrowed from Adair Turner. Since the crisis of 2008, in an era of austerity and supposed deleveraging, global debt to GDP ratios have gone from 174% in 2008 to 212% in 2014. Debt is still skyrocketing upwards. Or a slightly bigger historical picture, according to Andy Haldane, chief economist at the Bank of England, he's estimated that the financial sector in the UK, which of course consists simply of the activity of creating credits and debts, assets and liabilities, this has expanded on average at 4.4%, while the whole economy has expanded on average at 2.1%. This is a massive divergence over the course of time and explains where we are today. There's a long-term secular trend of debt to expand faster than positive commercial transactions. And this disequilibrium is manifest in the way that household debt rose from 15% of GDP in the UK from 1964 to 95% in 2007. This is an increase of little more than 1.5% per year, and it may sound small, but notice what is meant by these figures. Consider the money that you spend on a credit card in a shop. This is then used to pay wages, suppliers and investors who in turn will spend or invest the money, leading to a multitude of transactions, each of which counts towards GDP, all making use of that same money. So, if all that newly created money was respent 66 times in the course of one year, passing from one bank account to another, then it would be the basis for almost the whole of the GDP. Of course, it can't be spent that often in reality, for the excess borrowing from previous years is also still recirculating. But it conjures up the image of an entire economy that lives by borrowing alone, gaining access to goods and services, well, almost for nothing at the outset. This is an economy in radical dis disequilibrium. The source of such disequilibrium is clear, the creation of credit. As Turner explained, as I quoted before, banks make loans to borrowers, crediting an asset on the bank's balance sheet. At the same time, they put money in the borrower's account creating a bank liability. <coughs> the loan is repayable at a later date, but the money is immediately available. There's no balance here. There's no limit to the demand for purchasing power. Households increasingly spend more than they expect to earn in future. They make up the shortfall 
by an increase in house prices produced by such behaviour. There's no shortage of supply of credit <coughs> since banks create deposits by making loans. They do not require the money first. If such is the case, then there's no natural rate of interest, no balance between savers and borrowers, between supply and demand for credit. Credit can and has been expanded indefinitely. It's not a tendency towards equilibrium that guarantees stability and faith in money, for there is no equilibrium. <laughs> This is evident above all in the inflation of property prices and asset values in increasing inequality, since only some gain by this process, and in <coughs> ongoing global current account imbalances, each of which result from the unlimited growth in credit in certain countries like the United States and the UK. It's merely the growth in credit with central banks and sovereign states functioning as debtors of last resort that gives stability to the financial system. The value of money is based on faith in faith. Yet such faith in faith cannot ultimately support itself, leading to crises such as those of 1929 to 33, 2007 to 8. I don't wish to comment on policy options for addressing such an unstable situation today. I'll leave that to those with more expertise. Both King and Turner offer a review of some rather radical and promising suggestions. Instead, I wish to return to my philosophical question. What does it mean to tell a substantial truth about money? From what I've said so far, it seems to me that such substantial truths involve more than simply ascertaining the facts that can be verified by auditing accounts. They also involve more than inward appropriation, speaking out of the depths of one's soul. They involve more than isolating the substance of money from its accidents. For the truth about money involves the truth about a network of contracts and obligations, of credits, and debts, of acts of disciplined, trustworthy behaviour and actual outcomes in the global economy. The truth about money involves the foundations of faith and what will happen in the future. I do not know if I will repay my mortgage. I do not know if all such financial risks can be effectively insured, whether by reinsurance contracts, derivatives, central banks or sovereign governments. I do not know when the next financial crisis will strike. Such matters depend on more than just my conduct and more than the conduct of any one particular institution. So seeing money as a network of relations of faith can evoke an analogy with ecology. For our very existence is made possible by certain external conditions such as the availability of sunlight, clean air, fresh water, fertile soil. And what has emerged from adaptation to particular ecological circumstances and environmental niches is what we are. Similarly, in social and economic life, how we live is made possible by realities outside us. Just a very quick list of technological in inventions that have decisively changed how we live, how we think, what we are includes fire, the spear, the yoke and the plough, the wheel, the ship, writing, coins, the stirrup, the watermill, the printing press, the mechanical clock, the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, radio, television, the mobile phone, the internet and social media. There are ecological, technological, social and economic conditions of our existence and truth as a condition of trust involves response to these real external conditions. Similarly, the truth about money is a set of external relations. It is staged elsewhere. As Pope Francis observed of ecology in his recent encyclical Laudato Si, we live and act on the basis of a reality which has previously been given to us, which precedes our existence 
and our abilities. The same is certainly true for money. Both the wealth and the money that we enjoy has been almost entirely generated by others, whether in the past or the present, whether human or non-human. Its continuing existence and nature depends on external relations with other institutions. Yet economic life is unlike ecological life in one crucial respect. It depends not only on inheritance from the past and activity in the present, but on expectations about the future. As credit and investment, the substance of money is guaranteed only by what will happen. It's a matter of faith. In the same encyclical, Pope Francis explains the theology of creation as implying that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships. A relation to God, a relation to others, and a relation to the earth. The rupture of these relations, of any one of these, is a rupture of the others. To speak words of substance on this account, then, would be to speak of the, these grounds, to acknowledge our relations and dependencies, our creaturely limitations. It is to illuminate and renew our consciousness of these relations. To tell the truth about money is to tell the truth about our actual relations to others and to the actual place where in which we live. So real relations of inequality and injustice in relation to others, real relations of ecological devastation in relation to the earth, as described in the encyclical, are a vital component of the truth of money. But in a global, multicultural, secular or interfaith context, a context facilitated by the existence of money and its multiplication as credit. What truth can we tell about money and its relation to God? I would suggest that God and money overlap in the area of faith. Faith in money is a way of handling an uncertain future. We cannot anticipate what our future needs will be. We do not know if we will be capable of meeting our obligations. We do not know what future charges we might incur. The truth about the future lies in its accidents, not its rational expectations. So money as a means of future payments seems to offer a little substance and security. Yet if all were to lose confidence in the financial system at once, if all loans were defaulted on in a negative chain reaction, or simply repaid at once in a positive one, there would be virtually no money left. No substance, no security after all. Money offers security only insofar as debts endure and expand. To tell the truth about money, then, is to speak at once of a trust in its substance, of a debt to be repaid, and still yet of a kind of hope for individual redemption. It is to speak of a life lived to acquire money so that debts can be repaid. One of the medieval rationalizations of the prohibition of usury is relevant here. Usurers sell time which does not belong to them, for time belongs to God. An anonymous 13th century manuscript puts it this way. As all they sell is waiting for money, that is time, they're selling days and nights. But day is the time of light, and night is the time of repose. So they sell light and repose. To enter into debt is to sell one's own illumination and inner peace. To expect a return on credit offered is to stake a claim on someone else's future time, even though their responsibility is partial and at the mercy of circumstance. For a believer, time belongs to God. It is for God to judge how one apportions one's future time, one's attention, care and duty in accordance with justice, prudence and grace. It's not for the creditor 
to take the place of God and judge that future conduct purely in contractual terms. For each debtor will have other responsibilities, and it is for God to judge how well these are acquitted, not for a creditor to hold the debtor to account first. So to conclude, I want to suggest that the truth is that the substance of money created as debt is a life of service. The most substantial truth to tell about money appears in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Thank you very much for your attention.